Shout out Sean. Changing the game through real estate. Yeah. Changing the game through real estate. I can never wait. Got what it takes. It got this on my plate. And I got a budget. Teach you how to save. Listen to this podcast. You will be amazed. Play this any morning, any night, any day. We're the winning team. We were born to be brave. Yeah. All right. So today, uh, uh, with the change in the game, I'm really excited because it's kind of it's almost like who I want to be almost because I want to be getting to large multifamily, and I'm so happy that we get to have Melissa with us here today. So, um, if I remember correctly, you were your multifamily syndicator, right? Yes. Okay. And I believe, and I believe you said you went from zero to now you have like up to 759 doors under management. Yes, we have 759 under management. We have about 300 or so additional units that we don't actively manage, but we um, are GPs in that deal is in those deals as well. Uh, okay, so can you just t- kind of tell us like your backstory, kind of how like you got started in real estate, like what um, pushed you toward this path of real estate almost? Yeah, so. Um, my background is in business and nursing. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in business. Um, long story short, I was not happy in that career. So mm-hmm. I pivoted and went back went back to school to become a nurse. Um, I think nursing is a fantastic and rewarding profession, but the raises are small. And in order to make more money, you either have to climb the ranks and take a leadership position or go back to school. Most people choose to go back to school to either be a nurse practitioner or a nurse anesthetist. And so that was the route I took. But I was not happy in school. I really felt like I was going back to school because that was what you were supposed to do. But that's not what I necessarily wanted to do. And um, so while I was in grad school, I mean, I cried a lot. It really forced me to think of (laughs) what I wanted my life to look like. And like, was that, do I want to work for someone for the rest of my life? And the second I stop working, I don't have a paycheck. Or do I want to be able to spend time with my kids? Um, Do I want to be there for all of the little moments in life with them. Um, Do I want to travel the world and not have to worry about, um, you know, asking for time off and stuff like that. And so that brought me to real estate and um, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah. I feel like that's what people's biggest misconception is. Like everyone, when I talk to people, they're like, Oh, you just want, uh, you just want to get rich and um, like money's like all about corruption and stuff like that. And it's not really necessarily about that. It's the ability to kind of like do whatever you want. So you don't have to go to work or I'm going to, everyone's like, uh, well, you're doing all these things. Like uh, you're just all about wealth and all that stuff like that. I said, well, I'd rather um, work really hard now and have to spend all the times with my, uh, my newborn daughter later on than having to go to nine to five, like every single day and miss all that valuable time. So. Exactly. It's about the time freedom and using real estate as a vehicle to wealth, but wealth is not the end goal. Yeah. So how did you kind of get into real estate? Like, what was like, how did you decide like, oh, I'm going to get into real estate. This is how I'm going to do it. Like, kind of how did that come about? So I've always understood the power of real estate since I was a kid. Um, the stock markets, I don't understand because I, to me, it just feels kind of like speculation. Um, <laughs> so, but real estate, I've always understood. Um, so after I quit grad school, I just um, bought books and then started researching local real estate groups in my area. And um, from there, we found a um, like a mentorship program Mm -hmm. and thinking that we were only going to do single family homes because at that point, I knew nothing about multifamily. I didn't even know that um, buying multifamily properties and running them was a thing. I didn't realize people did that for a living. Um, So 
this mentorship group, they teach you about single families and multifamily. And once we, once we learned about all of the benefits of multifamily, we were sold and um, our mentors in that group encouraged us to like, if multifamily is where we want to end up, they said to skip single family altogether and go straight to multifamily. So we were like, uh, okay, that seems scary, but you know, we'll do it. And when you say we, is that you and your husband? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of, so do y'all work together full time? Is that, are you a team? We do now. Um, well, I, I've been working as a nurse up until May, 2021. So I was just able to leave my job, um, two months ago. So he's been handling it. (laughs) Thank you. That's great. Congratulations. He's, (laughs) He's been, um, so he retired from his corporate job in 2018. So this has been his full-time gig since then. Um, And I was just able to join the team full-time. Previously, I was just doing it like nights and weekends and helping where I could, but I am full-time now. That's wonderful. So for people who don't know, what is a multifamily syndicator? Because I know a lot of people like I said I've said that before, and no one, a lot of people have no idea what that is. Like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> like what that is. A multifamily syndicator um, is also known as a general partner or a GP, but it's someone who goes out into the market and locates an apartment complex and underwrites the deal, um, gets it under contract, and then raises capital from passive investors. Um, and then once the deal is closed, the syndicator um, manages the, the investment. So how do you go about getting to that though? Because uh, did you just like, okay, one day like, hey, you want to invest in your real estate? You want to invest in real estate? Here's the deal. Let's all do it. Like, how did that go about kind of, kind of doing that? So it was a little bit of a process because um, it, and we'll talk about this when we talk about my very first deal, but we did not feel comfortable taking other people's money when we didn't like, this is completely brand new to us. Yeah. So we decided to purchase an apartment complex um, just with a partner and run it ourselves. So we had no other passive investors. It was a 50, 50 split. Um, not only, financially, but also in terms of responsibilities. And um, so we operated that and basically got our feet wet and figured, figured out what it means to be a landlord or, you know, a property (laughs) manager. Um, And once we understood the multifamily market a little bit better, that's when we decided to branch out and syndicate because we knew that syndication would be the quickest way to scale. Right. And how many, how big was the first one? It was 54 units. Wow. That's, wow. that's a nice size. Very good. So I think yeah. my biggest, uh, like I, like originally when I started listening to bigger pockets, the first thing I really want to do is I love department building. So I started reading all these books, like multifamily uh, millions, all these books and everything like that. But my biggest, once I realized, once I got there, it's like, oh, wow. Like I have no money to do this. So how did, yeah. uh, did y'all more or less just save and put everything you had into the first deal? Like, how did you finance the, the first deal? That's a good question. Um, we had a decent amount of savings, but we also did a cash out refinance on our house. Mm-hmm. So the loan for that first property, we financed 75% of it and then brought the 25% down payment from our savings. So you, so you kind of did a little bit of both. A little, you had some savings, plus you did, you used your capital and your, in your, I mean, your equity. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So you said your first deal was the 54 unit uh, apartment building. Yeah. Was, was that kind of scary? Like, okay, I'm going to put everything I got into this one deal. So you must have been pretty confident in that one. That was a really good deal. So what made you gain the confidence to like kind of go all in? It's absolutely scary. And even even now that we're experienced, every deal is scary. Yeah. And, you know, if you're not scared, that, I mean, I think everybody is scared going into every single yeah, deal. Yeah. yeah, some sort of fear keeps your 
your your antennas up, you know, to exactly. protect yourself. Exactly. Um, we pretty much put our life savings into that deal. We um, had a little bit left over just because the lender does require you to have reserves. Yeah. Um, but we were confident that the property generated enough income to pay the mortgage. Um, well, we knew that based on actuals, um, we knew that that was true. Um, and yeah, cool. you just have to underwrite it conservatively and be confident in your numbers. Was it occupied? Were the, did you have 54 tenants or? It wasn't a hundred percent occupied, but it was somewhere in the nineties. Okay. That's pretty good. And did it need a lot of work? Did you have to renovate a lot of units? Um, yeah, well, yes. So on the exterior, it didn't need a whole lot of work. We did end up painting it just to let um, prospects and just people in the area know that it's under new ownership. Mm -hmm. um, but on the exterior, that's pretty much all we did. Um, most, of our, most of the money that we spent was upgrading the interior. So putting in vinyl plank flooring, mm -hmm. um, painting it. Um, new appliances if it needed it. But we only did that upon turns. So if a tenant moved out, then we would go in and upgrade it. Right. So it was mainly cosmetics. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So when you are looking at, uh, I guess, when you are searching the properties and once you found it, what's the process for doing a multifamily deal like that? What did you, what was like the first steps you did use? Like, what's the difference between like, hey, you bought your normal house to you buying this uh, um, large apartment building, what's the different steps that you take to purchase a multifamily house, a multifamily apartment? Uh, so it's a little bit different when um, you don't have to do syndication. Do you want me to talk about syndication versus um, just buying it for yourself? Or you uh, want me to talk yeah. about this first deal? Yeah, that's fine. More or less like how, like, you know, when you do an apartment building, you're going to have to put a... Uh, proof of funds and all that stuff, you know, like you're asking for like, you're going to get rent rolls. You're going to do, you'll know, ask for the profit and loss statements. Just kind of like, tell us how that your process is to go going through purchasing the first, your first apartment building. Yeah. So the seller's broker will generally provide all of that, the profit and loss, the rent roll, um, a T3 statement. Um, so that it's the financials going back three months. Um, so the proper, you can see that the property is performing mm -hmm. and, um, you will underwrite the deal and make sure the numbers still work. Um, I guess at the same time, we, we had a mortgage broker who went out and shopped the market for us oh, and okay. got us, um, different, you know, products, loan products. And, um, I mean, other than that aspect, I would say. If, when, if you're not syndicating, the rest is kind of similar to like a single family. Okay. So you just went through your due diligence period. You had the same home inspection. Once that was yeah. done, you just more or less waited your period and you closed on a certain day. Right. Okay. So when the appraiser is looking at it or when the, the mortgage company is looking at it, that if it's say 75% occupied, do they factor that in? Are there, are there more factors for are occupied than non-occupied? Yeah, they do. So if occupancy drops, that can affect the interest rate that you get. And it can also infect, affect the loan product that you get. So if occupancy is low, you probably can't qualify for a conventional financing. You'll probably have to do a bridge loan. Right. Okay. Because they usually like to see uh, greater than 85% or something like that, right? Uh, usually it's greater than 90. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So um, what was the criteria that you looked for? Were you looking for like a certain cap rate in a certain area? Like what were what were y'all looking for? We were, I don't even think we were. Uh, it's the first one. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's been, let me think. It's been five, almost six years now. But um, I don't even think we were looking for a certain cap rate at the time. We Our criteria was very specific. And that was, we want something that's at least 50 units because 50 is the sweet spot for um, being able to afford a full-time property manager mm -hmm. and a full-time maintenance technician because yeah. we were still working full-time. There's no way we could um, 
you know, like run this as our full-time job. It, it was just a side hustle in the beginning. And um, so, yeah, we needed someone on site to basically manage the day to day for us. Um, And we, at at the time we weren't even looking for um, a a value add deal, which is basically an undervalued um, property. We were just looking for straight cash flow. It's our first deal. We don't exactly know what we're doing. We'll be happy if we just have cash flow. Yeah. Um, So yeah, the numbers worked out. Um, I think our cash flow was like 7,000 to 8,000 a month. Um, But it turned out to be kind of a hybrid type deal where we were, we didn't think when we underwrote the deal that the market supported a rent increase, but after operating it for a year, we just tested them, tested the waters, increased rents and it stuck. So we, yeah, it ended up being a combination of cash flow and appreciation. Oh, okay. So now, what is, how's, what's that change? What are some certain criteria that you look for now that's different than that first one? We look for um, properties that have a hun- at least 150 doors mm-hmm. um, because we have found that regardless of the size of the deal, the amount of work you put into it is the same. (laughs) So, and it's actually more, um, it's actually harder for us to operate a smaller property than it is a larger property. You don't, you can't afford all of the different staff and the different resources that you can with a big property. Um, so yeah, 150 doors and then at rents at least $150 below market. Okay. Um, and we have been buying C class assets. We are looking to move into more of the B class. Right. And so we're just not there yet. I know that when I sell to investors, one of their big thing is metered. Do you want everything to be metered separately? Like is you know, so there's not just one water bill? I mean, what or do you factor that in? Is that an issue for you? It's it's not a big factor for us. Um at most of our properties we do rub, so we do bill back for water, um, water and sewer. Um, but no, that's not a, a big factor. And so, it, so I'm so your first property manager that was just a company in town, or did you hire somebody? We so we, um, one thing I guess that differentiates us from most multifamily syndicators um, is we do both asset management and property management. Uh So property management, as you know, is, you know, the day-to-day routine, you know, sign, sign the lease, get renewals, deal with maintenance issues. So we hire the team that does that Mm day-to-day, but we also manage the asset. Um, So with this first property, we did, do the hiring ourselves. Um, I actually found her on Craigslist. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but she is still with us to this day after we have sold the property and acquired seven other properties. She has stayed with us. Um, But, and then the maintenance man that we had that week that we had there worked for the previous owner um, and we kept him and he is still with us to this day. He, once we sold it, he um, came with us to the next property and then eventually branched out and start his own um, general contracting business. Oh, that's wonderful. But, so you help somebody yeah. grow in two weeks. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. So what was uh, some of the, like, I guess, issues that you ran into like when you, from your first deal to maybe your deal now? Like, what are some of the situations that you ran into that, hey, I would have done this a lot differently uh, if I could go back? What are some of the yeah. issues you ran into? Yeah, that first deal was a huge, um, you know, learning learning experience for us. Um, like I said, we were brand new to the game, didn't really know what we were doing. That property was pretty much the max we could afford without bringing in another partner. And so we, we maxed out our budget and didn't um, include renovations in we didn't factor in renovations into um our capital raise essentially Mm -hmm. um so we 
for a year, we didn't have any cash flow because we were using the cash flow to turn all of our units. So we quickly learn, you know, and you know, that affects your overall cash flow. So we quick, quickly re- learned that with the next properties, we would raise that renovation capital up front. Okay, that makes sense. So explain, I know when you said that class C, you know, there's B and then A, with, so people who don't know, explain A, B, and C as far as like rental properties. Okay. So an A class property is new, generally built in like the last five years. It's the luxury high rises that we see, or, you know, the Amleys, the Camdens, those types of properties right. that um, really don't have maintenance issues, attracts higher quality tenants, the working professionals, stuff like that, and are more in urban areas. Um, A B-class property used to be A-class at some point. Um, It's just older now. And um, you'll get a mix of working class professionals, but then you might also get tenants who... um, need to rent out of necessity. Like they, you could have long-term or, you know, lifetime renters in your B class. Um, Whereas your C class are much older properties, generally 70s, 80s products. Um, And I would say a majority of your tenants there are lifetime renters, um, blue collar type jobs, service industry type jobs. uh, the properties just aren't as well maintained. And I, do you accept Section 8? Are you utilizing that program on any of them? We do not. And that's a policy that we um, made from day one. We said we would never accept Section 8. Um, now, when we acquire properties, sometimes there are Section 8 tenants already existing. We don't kick them out. Um, but we don't accept new ones. And there are different schools of thought on Section 8. Um, Some people see it as guaranteed income, which I agree, it it, it pretty much is. Um, What we have found, especially in the Houston area, is with the Section 8, the Section 8 tenants aren't necessarily problematic, but sometimes they... um, the crowd that they hang out with come to the apartments mm-hmm. and create a problem. And so um, we just wanted to eliminate that issue altogether. So how do you get around not allowing Section 8? I thought you, if you have a certain amount of properties, you have to allow Section 8. Uh, or is it different in Texas? I no. Yeah. I um, I don't know if it's different per by state, but we aren't required to accept. Yeah, I think that, I think each state mandates that. Yeah, because Ken's a single family uh, property manager in uh, Virginia, and I think it's five in yeah. Virginia. You Once you own five rental properties or more, you have to accept Section 8. They just changed that law. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, well, and then what about the inside? Are you no one bedrooms? Are you two bedrooms only? Do you have any criteria about that that you found as a good indicator? Of- we do look for a good mix of one, two, and three bedrooms. Um, if it's if your property is um, heavily one bedrooms, you'll you'll get more of the transient people, people who are only looking to rent for a year and then will bounce to another place. Whereas the two bedrooms might attract families who will stay longer um so yeah a, a, a good mix of, of those so what what i guess uh you um what's some of the situations that you came across that you might have made uh, like a mistake that you happened through your journey what's some of the big mistakes that you made through your, uh, through your rise <laughs> i don't know um Gosh. Well, dang, I wish I was you because I make mistakes all the time. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there have been little things along the way, but I've, I've already told you the major thing that um, our biggest mistake was not having the funds to do renovations up front mm-hmm. and having to take it out of our cash flow. Um, 
but the the um, real estate group that we're a part of provides a really good blueprint for how to invest in multifamily so that you don't do it wrong. And so I think that's really helped us um, limit the amount of mistakes mistakes that we made. What's the name of the group? Is it like strictly only in Texas? Like they are nationwide, but they did start in Houston. It's called Lifestyles Unlimited. Oh, okay. And where can where can you find them? I think it's just lifestylesunlimited.com. Oh, okay. That works. <laughs> so would you suggest because it sounds like your mentorship really helped you out. Would you suggest everyone starting this probably find a mentor or mentorship group like that to kind of help them? I, so we paid for mentorship Mm -hmm. um, and I viewed it as, well, I dropped out of um, grad school. So the money that I'm saving in tuition there, I'm using to pay for this real estate mentorship. Um, So we just viewed it as tuition and the cost of education, essentially. Um, You... You don't have to pay for mentorship. There are a lot of resources there, but um, what I have found is that the resources out there aren't laid out step by step. Like first you should do this, second do this, third do that. Um, But I do think that regardless of what path you take, whether it's go shadow somebody or uh, pay for mentorship or, you know, just find a mentor who will talk to you for free on a weekly basis, whatever, I do think there is value in having someone to guide you and um, bounce ideas off of. What are some of the uh, like life lessons that your mentor taught you that really helped you through your journey in investing in multifamily? Life lessons, I guess dream big um, because our, I this is just not something I ever thought was possible for me. Um, and, and just never even anything that I thought of. Um, and then my mindset was pretty narrow at that time. Like I just wanted to do single families, like multifamily is scary. I don't know anything about it. Um, too much money. The properties are too expensive. I don't have that much money. Um, But those are really all self-limiting beliefs. And um, if you dream big enough, it can happen. So you'll find a way to make it happen. So if you're listening to this right now and you're like, okay, I really want to get into multifamily. What would you suggest would be the best best way to get started? Just to reach out and find a mentor who's already in that space. Like what would you suggest to, to get started? I would try to get as much education as possible. Um, however you do that is up to you, whether it's reading books, finding a mentor or, um, listening to podcasts, getting on social media, joining those groups and, um, learning from there or any combination of those. That's where I would start to make sure that the multifamily niche is really the route you want to go because it's not, um, I guess some people can make it look easy. There's a lot involved and the, um, the underwriting is not as simple as like buying a single family home. Um, so start with education and go from there. So uh, fast forward to your first deal to what you're doing now with multifamily syndicating. So what, what are the deals you're looking for now that uh, I guess you were talking about way larger deals like 100 units plus? Yeah, we won't even look at a deal if it's less than 150 units. Um, Like I said, the time you spend um, looking for it, locating it, getting under contract, it's the same regardless of whether it's 50 units or 150 units. Um, So might as well go bigger if you can. Um, One of the things that's always scary for us is uh, obviously the larger the deal, the larger the capital raise yeah. we are every single time we are unsure if we can raise that amount of money and um every single time we've been able to so it's just kind of we just have to push ourselves outside of our comfort zone and say yes you can afford that 400 unit 
apartment complex. And yes, you will be able to raise enough money because really the money is out there. People want to put their money in, in an investment that's not the stock market and put their money in a tangible asset. Um, so, yeah. Who did you find out? I know it would be scary to, to approach the first investor. So was that scary or did you know them already? Or how did you- so within Lifestyles Unlimited, um, there are a bunch of people who, um, a bunch of other investors who have no interest in being an active multifamily syndicator. They just want to put their money somewhere. So we raised money within that group. Um, so what we do is we do a lot when we're not, you know, actively purchasing a property. We do a lot of networking mm-hmm. and um, getting people on our investor list. And so. Once we do land a deal and get it under contract, we immediately send out an email and say, basically, the fund is open, um, this is our minimum investment, and um, we're able to raise money within that group pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Our latest acquisition, um, we raised, I think, over seven or eight million dollars within a week. Wow, that's wonderful. So how how do you go about even starting like a fund like that, how does that work? Let's say, hey, I, I found the property and uh, you created this fund. How does how do you creating a fund? How do you even do that? Um, so my husband could probably answer this better, but on a high level, there like you have to. Um, there are SEC guidelines essentially, and we um, open our. Um, offering to accredited, both accredited and non-accredited investors. And so accredited, um, I think, well, I, I think you have to either have a net worth of over a million dollars or something else. And then non-accredited, like you don't have to meet that criteria. Um, But we have to limit how many non-accredited investors we can take. Wow. Um, so, so does the mortgage already, company look at that? They this they, they see the the balance of credited versus non credited investors. The lenders do look at that mm-hmm. okay. also, but it's um, yeah. And so when you go to these investors, like you go on to lifestyle dot com, like you said, is where you find a lot of people. What do you have to supply? I guess you're having to supply what the building what you think you're going to get for rent. You have to supply a lot of documentation of what you think this project's going to provide. Yeah. So um, we have to provide the pro forma, which is where we think we can push rents to. Um, Where, when we think we'll refinance, when we think we'll sell, what we think the property will be valued at, at those times. Um, your plan for the property, what renovations are you going to do, um, the renovation budget. So there's just a lot. Uh, also, um, comps of other apartments in the area. Um, there's a lot that goes into it um, on the front end just to have a package or a presentation that you can show your passive investors to say like, hey, I've done my due diligence. Um, this, this is my plan for the property. This is where I can take it. And this is what it'll look like on the exit. Right. So I'm assuming, so the, these people say I put down 500,000 and you said, okay, well, I'm going to have that 500,000 back to you in X amount of years. Is that how it works? Because you're not paying dividends out to all these investors, correct? Like you're not sharing profits with them. We do. Yeah. We, so we pay distributions every quarter. And then um, at refinance, they will get some of their initial investment back. And then at sale, they'll also get, you know, whatever they put into it. And then more on top of it, if there's meat left on the bone. So uh, are you looking for initial, like I say, you put in, like you just bought 400 units. Are you uh, looking for, hey, I'm trying to get my investors like a 10% return on their money. And then after 10 years, you refinance, you get maybe all maybe half of your money back and then it's a smaller amount and then sale you get uh, what I guess even the, the 
to save, I guess, more money, I guess. Yeah. So we do have criteria when it comes to that. Um, we generally look for at least 7% cash on cash return. Um, like, I obviously at refinance, whether it's year three, year five, um, we ideally, we would like at least 100% return, but it's harder and harder to find those deals. So it's, it's um, really deal dependent, but yeah, at least 7% cash on cash um, and at least 50% um, return upon refinance. And can you explain to those who may not know what a cash on cash return is? Can you explain what, uh, what that is for people? Yeah. So if you, gosh, let me use, if you put in $10,000, um, cash on cash is your return on that $10,000 you put in. So if it's a 7% cash on cash, then you would get $700 every year. Okay. So uh, I guess... I think I did that math correctly. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry. You did it correctly. Yeah. So uh, are you offering any uh, deals right now? Or are you are you looking, are you locked in your, uh, I guess, next deal? Are you no, still- we, we are always looking, but we don't have um, anything that's set in stone. So where do you typically find your deals at? Um, we have developed a good network of multifamily brokers here in Houston. Um, so some within Lifestyles Unlimited, mo- most outside of Lifestyles Unlimited. Um, and once brokers know, once you're in the business for a while, you develop a reputation. Um, if brokers know you can close a deal, mm-hmm. then you're more likely to, to be someone that they bring a deal to when, when I guess it comes across their table. Um, And for that reason, it's hard for someone who has zero experience to break into the market because you have no credibility. Um, So that's why our first deal, we weren't looking for a home run. We just wanted to get into the market because we knew that would open up doors. And so we were okay with just a mediocre deal. Um, So how did your first deal go? Was it, do you think it was was a success? Of course, I guess it made it to where you are now, but did you think it was a good deal if you went back like oh this is still a good deal I honestly wish we didn't sell it (laughs) Um, yeah but I think everyone in real estate says that um we sold it two and a half years later for a hundred and one percent return oh wow that's really good Mm -hmm. so so with commercial I know it takes longer to make the deal I mean some commercials it takes a long time so how on the average how long does it take by the time you find that property to you've actually bought it and, you know, walked away with it. Um, okay. So I would say it probably takes about four months to find a deal. Um, the market is very competitive these days. And once you locate it and have an accepted um, LOI or letter of intent, um, it could be another... I don't know, two to four weeks of negotiation before you have a signed purchase and sale contract. Um, And then from there, you have typically 60 days to close. So I would say the whole process could be anywhere from three to four months from from the time you identify the property. Right. And do you still kind of like the old adage, are you still looking at location, location, location? Do you factor in schools? parking um yeah location is a is a big deal um for us we we three of our properties are in harris county which is the major county in tech in houston um and property they're just not harris county is not friendly when it comes to property tax appraisals and um and every year they increase our property taxes. So we're just finding that the numbers aren't working out as well in the Harris County market. So for us, we're looking at tertiary markets now, um, not only due to the property tax issue, but also because those tertiary markets are less competitive. 
Um, as far as like schools and stuff like that, we do like to purchase properties properties next to schools because it generally stays pretty occupied. Yeah. Um, you know, people want to be close to the school. They can walk their kids to school. Um, but I mean, mm-hmm. we look for a number of things. Is the um, is the market strong there? Are businesses doing well? So it's not, you know, just one factor. So let's say like uh, if someone wanted to invest with you, is there like a minimum and a maximum for like non-investors or non-accredited investors and accredited investors? We don't differentiate our minimum investment based on accredited versus non-accredited. In the past, our minimum investment has been 50,000, but we uh, will probably go up to 75 on our next deal. And in this market, as you know, I mean, I, you know, I have an aunt that lives out in Memorial. So, you know, I have people peppered around Houston. I know that your market's hot like ours is right now. Yeah. So have you backed off? Are you wait? Are you kind of sitting it out a little bit? Or are you going to? No, we're still, we're still looking. And um, I, we would like to get another property under contract before the end of 2021. But it's full steam ahead. Because <laughs> you never know, right? <laughs> yeah. That's so, awesome. if someone wanted to to see if they can be an accredited investor, how do they go about doing that? They just got to call um, call someone. How do they you get that title, accredited investor? Yeah, it's not like a certification or anything like that. Um, I should have looked this up before I came on, but you can just Google, you know, what accredited the criteria to have the accredited investor classification, it's either net worth or your annual income has to be over a certain amount. I think if Um, I remember correctly, I think it was a million dollars net worth or you make like 200 something uh, thousand dollars or something like that a year. I thought it was 200 too, but it it could be, I think 300 if you're a couple. Don't quote me on that though. So I guess as a... uh, um, of a syndicator, everyone's going to wonder, like, okay, what what's in it for you? If uh, all, everyone's bringing all the uh, all the money to the table, do you get like a certain percentage of the deal. Like, what do you is a syndicators get from the, uh, the deal? How do you you make money? I guess. So we also put money into the deal. Um, so we have a percentage of the equity as well. Um. um so, in general syndicators make um, an acquisition fee and then an asset management fee. Um, And then they'll make a certain percentage upon sale or refinance. Um, We don't charge an acquisition fee. So where we make our money is from the asset and property management. So we make a 2% asset management fee um, and a 3% property management fee. And then on refinance, that's where we make um, a good chunk of our money and then also on the sale. Well, and that's at 5%. That's pretty good because I know here we're 10 and, you know, just for your average, you know, property manager. So 5% managing your property and stuff, that's, that's, that's a good deal. That's yeah. Awesome. 5% is typical in multifamily. Yeah. Well, two and 3%. Yeah. Cause you're doing a lot larger units. So it's a lot larger. Money. Right. Right. So I guess, uh, I guess my biggest question is, uh, so I don't know, I feel like you answered most of my questions. Did you have any? Uh, no, I just think it, I just think it's wonderful that what you do. So what, so what do you like so much? What's your favorite thing? I have an eye for design. So my favorite part of um, real estate is the, the initial part of it, um, looking at the property and seeing what renovations we can do to increase the value of the property. Um, So I'm very involved in the renovation and design of the leasing office, the model unit, um, adding certain amenities, and then um, looking at the interior of each unit and seeing what upgrades we can make to either bring it up to the level of our competition or slightly better than our competition. Um, Because all of those things, factor into increasing your NOI, which is the whole point of all of this. <laughs> right. Well, one of my favorite shows, I don't know if you've ever seen it, um, is World's Worth Tenants. 
And there's, oh my mm-hmm. goodness. Well, anyway, hey, what did you have a funny story about a tenant? Oh gosh, yeah. Okay, yes. Oh, yes. This leads me to, I guess, one of the mistakes we made <laughs> initially. Yeah, <laughs> um, so with our very first property, we um, we have an LLC for each property has its own LLC. Um, so we created an LLC and put our home address as the LLC address. And um, we had a tenant who, well, okay, she wasn't the tenant. Her dad lived at the property and rumor had it she was prostituting out of his unit. She did not live there. Uh, she was not on the lease. And when, so neighbors complained about it. Um, the, the property manager um, addressed the dad, um, which caused basically telling the dad he can't allow this to happen. Um, and the daughter got upset, um, threatened their property manager. When that didn't go anywhere, she, found um the LLC address which was our home address oh, and so wow. so she drove um from my house to that property was 54 minutes without traffic so if at least an hour if you're sitting in traffic so she drove over an hour to my house and sat in my driveway hoping that she could catch us um, and talk to us. Fortunately, we weren't home that day. Well, we weren't home at the time. We were we were just out and about. Um, and our mailman, who we have a really good relationship with, just recognized it as suspicious. And so when he walked up to put mail in our mailbox, she jumped out of the car and asked him if we lived there. And um, he was just like, I can't give you that information. So she, then she asked my next door neighbor who um, was just like, I don't know. And my next door neighbor had just moved in a week ago. So we really did not know each other. <laughs> um, oh, how was she dressed? <laughs> I, I have no idea. Um, but my mailman intercepted her and I'm so thankful for that. Um, and then gave us a recap of what happened. Um, but from that day on, we have had cameras at our house and we changed our LLC address to using a, um, a registered agent. So no, just stop <laughs> everyone. Be nice to your mailman. <laughs> yeah, it took him well. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know my mailman. I'm going to have to be friends with him now. <laughs> what would you have done when you said like, uh, oh no, that's uh, that's the wrong person. That's a different person. Like, well, I don't even know what I said. I don't, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what we would have done. Um, Did she, end up pro- she ended up leaving. Yeah. Uh, uh. Um, but we told our property manager about it, about the situation who then talked to her and our property manager just told her that we don't even live there. It's a rental home. Like, so she never tried to contact us again. Well, that's good. That's funny. <laughs> Oh wow! So I guess my um, I guess one last question I have. So people that invest with you, do they get tax benefits also, or is it just uh, just a re- uh, you get a return every uh, every quarter? Every investor um gets to take part in the tax benefits. We the very first year we acquire a property, we always do a cost segregation study, so everyone gets to take advantage of bonus um, depreciation. Um, and that cost egg study. Okay. It is. It's been so nice talking to you. It's what a it, oh. breath of fresh air. I just love to hear how successful and you really did a good job just, you know, kind of explaining everything. I learned a lot today. Yeah, I, I've learned that I really need to get on that list. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be a credit investor. Pull that million dollars up. <laughs> But um, so for people who don't know you, what's the best way to find more about you or to get a hold of you or where can we, um, where are you located more or less? Not your address. I'm asking. <laughs> asking for like, where we find you like on social media and stuff. Yeah. So I'm pretty active on Instagram at Investor Girl Mel. Um, my husband and I, 
we have a vertically integrated asset and property management company called Lumen Capital. Um, you can go to lumencp.com and reach out to us there. Um, right now, our our deals are private. We don't generally raise funds from the public, but that, that is something that we um, could are looking into doing in the next couple of years. So um, if there's enough interest, so yeah, reach out to us and um, we'll start the conversation there. So like not taking it public or public, would you eventually think about taking it actually physically public, like on the stock market or? No, public as in we, so thus far we've only raised money within Lifestyle, within our group of people that we've met through Lifestyle okay. Unlimited. Um, so going public means I would raise funds or, you know, raise capital from like random people I don't know. Yeah. I got you. It makes sense. Because then that way, like, uh, at least you have that relationship with you and they trust you and it's probably less stressful that way also. Yeah. There there are benefits of um, going that route as well. Cool. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming on here. Yeah, I was really excited. You. And I uh, actually think you actually lived up to everything. I was looking oh. forward to it. <laughs>